Hello everyone, before I get into today's video, I wanted to announce I have started a Patreon account to help grow the channel. It has been a solid start for my channel, and I want to take it to the next level one day in terms of production value and quality. I want to get access to a better stock footage library at the minimum, and invest in more research materials. If you feel like my content is worth investing in, I would be honoured if you would donate to my Patreon. Also, for more updates, please follow me on my Twitter and join my Discord community on the link below. Building a community is something I would like to do, so if any of this interests you at all, check out the description and access all these socials. With that all out of the way, let's get into today's video. There's a debate in many political circles, and in particular feminist circles, about the role of sex work in society. Sex work can range from selling images and videos online, to working as a lap dancer at a strip club, and all the way up to prostitution. When most people talk about sex work, they are normally focusing on the latter, commonly referred to as the oldest profession. Prostitution is present in virtually all societies across the world, with varying cultures around the trade and various legal approaches to prostitution. I want to make one thing absolutely clear. I am only pro-sex work in the sense I do not want to restrict the earning potential for sex workers, or their freedom to engage in such activity, and to look after the most vulnerable people that matter in this trade, the workers themselves. I don't think sex work is necessarily as empowering as some people assert, nor do I believe it provides positive externalities in society. Moreover, I don't think it's something which should be viewed as shameful either, and people who are currently active or who were formerly involved in the trade shouldn't be treated as social pariahs or seen as less favourably for being sex workers. I do find the industry, or at least aspects of the sex industry, somewhat gross, but a commoditization of certain products or services can make me feel this way. Some things, in my personal opinion, should never be up for sale. However, I am in no position to judge nor would I ever want to enact anything against people who engage in such practice. Even if I wanted to, I would be denying one constant reality when it comes to banning things. We see this in the purchasing of drugs and in alcohol. The same is more or less true for sex work. There's not much you can do to stop this demand. Whatever my opinion is, sex sells. Prostitution is colloquially called the oldest profession in the world for a reason. So I want to look at the Nordic model to prostitution, see what it does, what its goals are, and if it's effective. Then I'll get into the reason why it appears the Nordic model may have some failures. The first thing to note is the term the Nordic model isn't exactly what it suggests. Using this term is rather an oversimplification of what many of the Nordic countries have adopted and why. There is no one-size-fits-all approach in how these countries have brought in these laws. The Nordic model originally used to be called the Sweden model, since the concept of criminalising the purchase of sex began in Sweden. The original proposals came about in 1995, which looked to ban both the selling and the purchasing of sex, but when it went to a public review, the criminalisation of the selling, which was originally supposed to be criminalised, was dropped. The policy was originally enacted in Sweden, found its way to Norway in 2009, in Finland starting from 1999, then updating to 2012, and in Iceland by 2013. Other countries which are non-Nordic which have adopted a similar law are countries such as Canada, Israel and the Republic of Ireland. One of the things the various Nordic countries have tried to combat is the human trafficking element involved in the sex trade. Denmark made it a law that a person from a third country, one outside of Denmark, went to Denmark with the intention to sell sexual services, they will be in the breach of Danish law. 51 women in 2002 were expelled from the country on these grounds. Interestingly, Denmark, though it is a Nordic country, doesn't have laws in line of the Nordic model, which a few of my Danish Twitter mutuals made clear to me before I decided to research this video. Norway and Sweden took a different approach to the Danish. The two nations saw prostitution as more of a societal issue and they actively went down the road of trying to reduce the amount of prostitution taking place in their countries. Since it is now a societal issue, it is seen as a state responsibility. In Denmark, there was never an emphasis on it being a public issue, 
or for one for the state to see as a public responsibility to legislate on. The odd thing is all three saw prostitution as a societal issue, but the Danes didn't use it the way to bring in legislative action. Meanwhile, the Norwegians and the Swedes did see prostitution as a societal issue and did use it as grounds to intervene legally. Even though the Norwegians and the Swedes see prostitution as something for the state to intervene in, both nations saw it in a different way. This happened around the 1970s and the 1980s when the national debate was starting to pick up steam. Sweden's approach was from a feminist perspective, whereas the Norwegians saw it from a class perspective. The Swedish approach and argumentation against criminalising sex work was centred around the belief that prostitution was a patriarchal construct oppressing women, whereas the Norwegians saw it as a system that oppressed people from lower classes in society. The thing to note when it comes to the implementation of the laws around prostitution is that no nation approaches it in a vacuum. The laws are entirely dependent on the context of the time. Sweden saw gender as the biggest cause of prostitution, and the difference between the individuals involved in prostitution and the groups involved weren't heavily considered. In Sweden, prostitution itself is mirrored closely to women's violence. Even though prostitution had not been officially referred to as violence before the 1999 law, the government has viewed it as closely related to violence against women. And by 2002, the government had officially defined prostitution as men's violence against women. Mona Salin, the then Minister for Equality, explained to a journalist, If you are a feminist, you cannot relate to prostitution in any other way than to see it as male domination. The bill itself has been criticised by many when it was implemented. Some people have argued that commercial sex is a legitimate commercial line of work, and that prostitution should be viewed no differently than any other profession. Other critics were concerned that if the policy itself was implemented, it could actually be damaging to the people it's meant to protect, the sex workers, the most. The important thing to remember is that the Swedish government framed their legislative changes on the basis of exploitation, so these acts, which were considered voluntary, are seen in the lens of exploitation. The then Swedish Minister of Justice, Thomas Brustrom, had responded to criticism by stating, Sweden has for a long time now actively promoted a number of questions in the EU in order to combat serious crime. One of these proposals involves creating rules for the storage of information on, among other things, telephone traffic. Information of this kind has shown itself to be of critical importance, not only in combating terrorism, but also, for example, murder, human trafficking, drug crime and child pornography. When considering their approach to this, the Swedish government felt it necessary to bring in law changes to criminalise the purchasing of sex, since the sex trade, in their view, is something deemed serious enough to try and stop. Now if you agree with the laws of the Swedish government, or not, is not really what's being discussed here. This is merely the rationale of how Sweden has got to where it's got regarding its laws. Something that many people are aware of, especially since the turn of the century, is the world is far more globalised, and this includes all markets. From food, to electronics, to services. These are all more freely available from all corners of the world and accessible to many. Prostitution is also a market, and the fact that prostitution was becoming more globalised was a concern for the Norwegian government by the late 2000s, and especially concerning on how to combat human trafficking. The Norwegian approach was different in its outset from the Swedish one. The sellers of sex were seen as vulnerable, like in Sweden, but in Norway, their vulnerability was seen in the sense that people had fewer opportunities to find work outside of prostitution. It is not that the Norwegian government isn't concerned with, or has never been concerned with, gender inequalities. It was just seen as secondary to the problem of economic inequalities. The debates around Norway originally focused on class inequalities. The poorer classes, who were lacking opportunities, saw prostitution as their only way out of poverty. However, as the years have rolled on and into the 21st century, the focus on global inequalities became the larger concern. There were now increased numbers of foreign prostitutes working in Norway, which led to the criminalisation of purchasing sex in 2009. The interesting comparison to draw between Norway and Sweden is the dichotomy of feminist groups in their respective countries. As noted, Swedish feminists were largely on board and supportive of bringing in the law to criminalise purchasing sex. However, the Norwegian feminist groups were more divided, 
The debate around Norway's criminalisation was also much more fiercely debated among political corners compared to Sweden, especially in these feminist circles. Regardless, the Norwegian government went ahead and criminalised prostitution in 2009. The Finnish route to their laws is slightly different to the Swedish and the Norwegian ones of banning prostitution. In 1999, the city of Helsinki made it a criminal offence to sell and purchase sex in the streets, and this law became nationwide by 2003. The rationale behind it was it would promote safety in public places by taking sex workers away from the streets, but it may have led to an unintended consequence for some sex workers. It's been noted by many that sex workers in Finland who operate on the streets are foreign. This is important to note, as the Norwegian model talked about and even mentioned the fact the sex trade had become more globalised. Thus in Finland, it has been argued that the prostitution market has now become a two-tiered system, with Finnish sex workers working indoors and therefore in much safer conditions compared to foreign workers who tend to work the streets, which was now less safe and even a criminal offence for them to do so. The Finnish law itself is seen as a contradiction to the entire concept of these models, as it seems to be directly punishing the seller, which was not meant to be the point of these laws. When it comes to Iceland, it's worth noting that the Icelandic debate around banning the purchasing of sex came from a similar feminist perspective as the Swedish argument, and in 2009, the Icelandic government brought in a law banning the purchasing of sexual services. Denmark has had the discussion before around banning the purchasing of sex, but as I have already mentioned, there are no laws in effect just yet, as the Danish attitude towards prostitution doesn't seem to be as strong as its Scandinavian neighbours. As it stands, Denmark does not criminalise the purchasing of sexual services. Success is something which is hard to quantify because we have to ask ourselves, when it comes to these laws, what was the objective of the law in the first place? It seems when looking both into the Swedish and Norwegian approaches to criminalising the purchase of sex, the objective was the same. Reduce the amount of prostitution occurring in these countries. By that metric, it's still hard to say for certain if the model is an outright success. It appears that in terms of street sales of prostitution, they have reduced. The Swedish government have claimed in a 10 year period since the implementation of their laws, they have halved. However, academics have doubted if these reported reductions are accurate or not. There is one nation, which I have mentioned before, which have adopted a similar system to the Nordic approach, and that is the Republic of Ireland. They too have implemented a similar system and there has been some interesting indications since its induction. The Republic of Ireland have brought in laws which, in effect, have brought in a similar system to the Nordic model of prostitution. In the Republic of Ireland, the Criminal Law Sexual Offences Act 2017 brought in some new amendments to the 1993 Act, which brought in measures that led to the criminalisation of purchasing sexual services in the Republic of Ireland. Section 25 of this Act states that payment for sexual activity with a prostitute a person who pays, gives, offers or promises to pay, or give a person, including a prostitute, money, or any other form of remuneration, or consideration for the purpose of engaging in sexual activity with a prostitute, shall be guilty of an offence and shall be liable on summary conviction, a. in the case of a first offence, to a class E fine, and b. in the case of a second or subsequent offence, to a class D fine. In this section, sexual activity means any activity where a reasonable person would consider that a. whatever its circumstances or the purposes of any person in relation to it, the activity is because of its nature sexual, or because of its nature, the activity may be sexual and because of its circumstance, or the purposes of any person in relation to it, or both, the activity is sexual, in section 8, by the substitution of the following subsection for subsection 2, a person who without lawful authority or reasonable excuse fails to comply with a direction under subsection 1 shall be guilty of an offence and shall be liable of a summary conviction to a class D fine or imprisonment for a term not exceeding 6 months or both. In section 9, by the substitution of the following subparagraphs in 1 and 2, on summary conviction to a class A fine or imprisonment, for a term not exceeding 12 months, or on conviction of indictment to a fine of imprisonment of a term not exceeding 10 years or both. 
The laws are quite firm in Ireland, and I'm not going to go through all the punishments for this offence, but they do vary in their strength. It's very clear that the Irish state have tried to clamp down on prostitution, at least from the sex purchasing side, which falls in line with which the Nordic countries have been doing for the last 20 years. The problem is, there have been some issues with the law implemented in keeping sex workers safe. Not collateral damage, trends in violence and hate crimes experienced by sex workers in the Republic of Ireland. The authors looked into a survey done by a group called UglyMugs.ie, who are a non-profit group who have produced a network for Irish sex workers to report on potential dangers of other clients. The paper itself does warn that this is a third-party reporting service, so it might not be fully reflective of all sex workers in Ireland. But there is one issue with these kind of datasets, is that it's quite difficult to find reliable sources on collecting such data. So surveys, should not be taken as gospel for obvious reasons, could be an indicator of what's happening. One thing which is noted is the geographical distribution of the crime reports between 2015 and 2019 by region in the country. Remember, the law came into effect in 2017, so this gives us a slight indication of before and after the implementation of the law. In their findings, the largest numbers of reports were incidents in Dublin, 44.78%, which is unsurprising given it's the capital and has the largest population, followed by Cork, 12.04%, Limerick, 10.02%, and Galway, 5.94%, reflecting large urban areas. The rise in crime incidents reportedly the app has increased substantially since the law was introduced, crime incidents towards women have nearly trebled, and crime incidents towards trans people have more than quadrupled. Reports by male sex workers have been more varied, with one steep increase, but then a dramatic reduction to around a similar level. More frightening than any of the other figures reported is showing that crime reports to Ugly Mugs have risen since March 2015-16 to March 2018-19, but police reports still remain quite low. The year the law was implemented, only four such incidents were reported to the police. Sex workers are feeling even more reluctant, it seems, to report crimes to the police since their profession is illegal. Furthermore, an interesting and quite upsetting case involving two Romanian migrants, Adrina Paru and Anna Tomascu, were brothel keeping, which is a practice where sex workers will rent or own a premises to use and sell and perform their services at, since this tends to be safer for sex workers to operate, in Newbridge, County Kildare, were found guilty of brothel keeping at the Nass District Court, each woman receiving nine months prison sentences. One of the convicted women was pregnant at the time of her conviction. This was labelled by critics as harsh and completely unjust. Ireland's implementation of criminalising the purchasing of sex seems to have been quite firm, there has been a serious effort by the Irish state to clamp down on the sex industry in their country, but some are starting to think that this is too firm. The brothel keeping case is an example of where sex workers are being penalised for selling their services, rather than just a clientele purchasing them. Ireland has introduced firm sentences for people purchasing sex, and more so for repeat offenders, but sex workers are reporting it less safe to operate and are not reporting to the police as much as previously before. For me, the most damaging conclusion of all of them comes from the article, not of collateral damage. Findings reveal several important facts about workers in the Republic of Ireland, which states that violent crime increases, the prosecution and penalisation of sex workers does not end, sex workers remain subject to high levels of policing, and targeting sex workers by the police increases in multiple intersecting ways, with the police remaining focused on the repression of sex workers via public order or immigration agendas. Research in three jurisdictions that have introduced criminalisation of sex purchase found that sex work regulation operated primarily through immigration and that third-party laws with migrant workers as the primary targets. This increases sex workers' precarity because they are pushed to work in riskier conditions and are less able to enact screening and other safety strategies, for example, rush negotiations on the street. Indoor workers who previously would not go to buyers' homes or other outcall locations are now under increased pressure to do so to avoid detection by the police or eviction from their own homes, a concerning state of affairs. 
Ultimately, sex workers have had their roles become less safe. Regardless on your moral stance on prostitution and sex work as a whole, surely the matter of making sure sex workers are safe would override any personal views on prostitution. I know from my perspective, it certainly does. In closing, I also think the Nordic models have to make us think carefully about how we talk and view sex work. I believe in my introduction, I made it clear I'm not the biggest fan of sex work. For many reasons, I think it's rather problematic, especially when you break down how some of the laws have been implemented, treating citizens different from others. Sex work isn't a moral good, and it isn't immoral either. It just is. And one constant thing, like I alluded to before, trying to ban something where there's a clear demand just doesn't work. And the priority should be in that point, to make sure everyone who's involved is as safe as they possibly can be.